welcome back to Casual Climbers, the podcast by and for beginning hikers. I'm your host, Donna Patrick, and alongside me is my husband and adventure buddy, Roy. Hi. Hi. So in this podcast, we provide you with tips, tricks, and reviews of some of the many hiking trails in the Blue Ridge area. And for this final week, the greater Appalachian Mountains region. Now, we may be unfit hikers. But we do love the outdoors, and we want to share our experiences with you. In today's full episode, we are in the final Kentucky trail that we did in Cumberland Gap National Historical Park, Object Lesson Road to Tri-State Peak Trail. We also have a fun fact about some amazing women who helped bring literacy to rural Kentucky in the earliest part of the century, and review the Dutch Treat, a great Dutch deli, bakery, and store in nearby Rose Hill, Virginia. What do you say, Donna? Ready to get started? Let's go. So here's Object Lesson Road to Tri-State Peak Trail by the numbers. The distance is 2.5 miles there and back. The time it took us was 1 hour and 25 minutes, and of that 1 hour and 14 minutes was actual moving time. The lowest point is 1,348 feet, and the highest point is 2,010 feet. So that is a 662 feet elevation change that you definitely feel. Oh, yeah. Now, the friendliness of the trail, the pets are allowed, but there's no way you're getting mobility scooter in there, at least not very far. It's rocky, rooty, and there's narrow parts of the trail, rocks you have to climb over in some parts, so it's not very friendly. It starts pretty wide, but it gets unfriendly pretty quick. Object Lesson Road is fine. You can get a mobility scooter on that, but to go up to Tri-State Peak, you're not going to be able to. Yeah. So first of all, to get there, search for Thomas Walker parking area in your map app. And that's going to be in Middlesboro, Kentucky. And the parking area is huge here. Oh, yeah. There's probably space for 100 cars. No bathrooms in no. the parking area. But no. but the there's a Cumberland visitor. Gap Historical National Park is like there's a visitor five center. minutes away. Yeah. Yeah. The visitor center is five minutes away. So if you but have to go to the bathroom, go there. Yeah. First. Either before or after. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think. Yeah, we went after. So the trail actually starts at the old Object Lesson Road. And now this this road was constructed in 1907 to convince voters of the convenience and value of building better roads with up-to-date techniques. So it was actually a lesson road. Okay. And what this does is takes you to this to uh, up to what's called the, quote, Saddle of the Gap, which is the area where folks pass from Kentucky and from Virginia into Kentucky along the Wilderness Road. So you are actually walking along, as we've done several parts in these past few weeks, on the Wilderness Road that Daniel Boone and hundreds of thousands of others did yep. back in the 17 and 1800s. Yep. This is a beautiful and well-maintained trail, Donna. hmm What was the first thing that stood out to you? The deer. <laughs> the deer that were just right there. Wait, I pulled out my phone real quick and just started videotaping some deer that were off to the side in the brush and they were not freaked out by us. Two minutes in, we saw two deer. Yeah. Two minutes in. Yeah. Now we went early morning. This was early morning on a Friday. It was cold too. It was, it was pretty it chilly. It was cold. It was pretty chilly. This was October 25th? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And two minutes in, we turned the corner and I said, Donna, look. There were two deer. And these are not tiny deer. These are big deer. These are Kentucky deer. Yeah. Standing on the side of the road, just having breakfast. The On the side of the, the tra- trail road. The Object wilderness. lesson road. Yeah, yeah the whatever. Trail. <laughs> whatever yeah. you want to call it. it. This isn't paved. Let it's, me get that out of the way. It's not a this car road. This is a road. dirt and gravel trail. Yeah. That was maybe as wide as a covered wagon. Mm-hmm. Not, not very big. Yeah, just sitting right there, just standing right there, having just their having, breakfast. Having their breakfast. We're not, I mean, they were cautious of us, but they did not run no. when they saw us and we walked by them We with, within maybe 10 feet. Of yeah, them. when we heard, the, usually when you hear the rustling in the brush next to you, it's usually a squirrel or a chipmunk or maybe a bird, but once in a while, it's a deer that's just having their breakfast and it's so cool. It was amazing. Yeah. It was amazing. Uh, another great thing about this trail, especially on the object lesson road portion, is that there are a bunch of historical markers that tell you about Wilderness Road, the making of Object Lesson Trail. Like there's one at, at the pinnacle of Object Lesson Road right before you turn off to go to Tri State Peak that tells you about 
how this is where Daniel Boone took led people through the Cumberland Gap into yeah. Kentucky. Are you are you talking about the masterful retreat sign? No, that was just one of the many. Yeah. So there's there's signs about the Civil War having used that road and the trail going through there. I mean, this is a very historically rich place. Yes. And the Daniel Boone Monument is there, right there at the terminus, or at, I'm going to say terminus is a bad word, at the pinnacle of Object Lesson Road. There's a big, I don't want to say obelisk, it's more of a pyramid, a cutoff pyramid that is a monument to Daniel Boone himself, mm-hmm. right there. But that's where the climb begins. So we mentioned that it's 662 feet of elevation change. That's where it almost all starts. But this is a two and a half mile there and back. And Object Lesson Road is only half a mile. So you have a mile to go 662 feet up, which is not very much. But I didn't find the elevation to be overly challenging. No? No. Okay. Well, your back was feeling much better that day. It was feeling day. better that day. <laughs> Did you find that to be challenging? No, probably not. I, not now that I think about it. I mean, Mm-mm. yeah. No, we weren't huffing and puffing. There's no, there's no benches. I was more concerned about how cold it was, but I was prepared. I wore my thermals that day. Did you? Yeah. Yeah, I, I had a jacket on. And of course, you know, I always wear my hiking pants when I go. So it wasn't too bad. I, the, the, the climb wasn't bad, but what did we see on this trail? On this, the Tri-State Peak Trail? More deer. Three more deer yeah. <laughs> right on this side. Like they were in the trail. As we came up, and they were maybe a yeah. hundred yards away from us. They were crossing. There was a cave, and they were crossing from one side to the other. We were looking at that cave, thinking, "Oh, oh there's a bear in there." Yeah, and bear. the deer were just crossing right in front of that cave. So I guess we got within probably twenty yards of the deer, and they did not run away. They just kind of scooted off the trail, but stayed real close. Yeah, and we walked right by them, and they they were not shaken up at all. Just keeping an eye on us, but not shook deer. you took a ton of pictures of the deer. Yeah, they're not great pictures. I'm looking at them now. You can, you can see them. Oh, that's a good picture. Yeah. So she'll post them on our Instagram like we always do. Yeah. Yeah. I have some too. I'll share if you, if any of them might be better. I don't know. I think I did, you know, like how you can zoom a little bit with your phone. I don't like to do that because things get a little blurry, but yeah, they, they got, I got decent. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Yeah, so we'll post those on the Instagram so you guys can see them. Yeah. So what's at the pinnacle of Tri-State Peak Trail? Well, hang on. I'm still looking at my deer pictures. <laughs> well, move on because we've got a podcast to do. Okay. At the pinnacle is, well, I mean, it's the Tri-State, you know, trail, right? So you've got Tennessee. and we, You have this, this spot. And I took a picture of you on this spot. You were kind of like doing a push-up of... I had one hand. So we're going to back up a little bit. Okay. Okay. At the top of the trail, there's a gazebo. Mm -hmm. And this gazebo is where Tennessee, Virginia, and Kentucky meet. Right. That's the tri-state. So there, you are at the point of three states. Yes. And so it's very clearly marked. There's this paved ground underneath the gazebo. And there's a marker for every sing- for each of the three states, and it tells you some facts about the state, how big it is, you know, the landmass, what the state bird, state tree is. It's yeah. kind of neat. And it's facing each state. So if you're standing in front of the Virginia placard, you're, you're facing- looking at Virginia. And st- stand standing, technically standing sta- in Virginia. And, and then you walk five feet to your left, and you're standing in Tennessee, and five feet to your right, and you're standing in Kentucky. It's gorgeous. And so there is a spot right in the middle, and Donna will probably put the picture in there, where I had one hand in Tennessee, one hand in Kentucky, and my feet in Virginia. Mm -hmm. So I was in three states at once. I probably paid tax on all three while I was there. I don't know. I I don't think that's how it works. I think that's how it works. I think technically I was a resident. It might feel like how it works, but it is not. I'm pretty sure. Okay. I just stood like in the middle of where the states all come together. so. So I'm sure you were in all three. If you stand right there at the at the pinpoint middle. Yeah. Yeah. And so the views are really great. If you look in at the Kentucky side, you're going to look over Middlesboro and then more of the Cumberland Gap. I mean, the whole area is Cumberland Gap. So you're looking at the Cumberland Gap, but it's it's pretty spectacular. It really is. It really is. Did you have a favorite view? 
Did you feel like one of them was prettier than another? Probably the Tennessee one was better. You think so? Only I because thought- I think it was wider open okay. and there was less city. Like I didn't. There were looking power over lines a city going right okay. over the thing toward Kentucky. Virginia, I think. No, oh, yeah. Kentucky. Yeah. Kentucky. That's yeah. right. Yeah. You were looking under power lines and. Yeah. Yeah. Not that great. Took, and took and then you're looking at the city of Middlesbrough. So. Which, eh. no, we, like Middlesbrough's great, I'm sure. It's, it's fine. Yeah. It, but when you hike all that way, you kind of want to just see I want to see nature. Yeah. yeah. Which you still can. Yeah. I, I, I'm not taking anything away from it. I feel like you are. Maybe a little. But <laughs> at least with the Tennessee, all you see is mountain, and forest, Virginia. and valley. And yeah, Virginia. and the Virginia side. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's really great. It's a really great way to do it. The, it's a big elevation change, 662 feet, but it's over the course of a mile. And I didn't feel like it was too steep in any given part. Yeah. We didn't have to stop at all. I mean, we stopped to look at the deer. But yeah. we didn't stop because we were out of breath. Right, right. I might have gone a little bit slower than you, because I I normally go slower than you. Yeah, maybe a little bit, but it wasn't. It wasn't. I don't think it was too bad. No. No. It's and then, of course, the way back is a nice, gentle decline, so it's easy to make your way down. Yeah. Yeah. What I was mean, that Daughters of the Revolution thing that was there? Was that the Daniel Boone? Yes. Thing. Yeah. That, you were talking that was about? the Daniel Boone monument. Okay. And th- we got pictures of it, so you know we'll put all those on Instagram, but. It was, so this is the last podcast that we cover for, for our, our Kentucky trip to Kentucky and Virginia. Yeah. And I absolutely love the area and it's so full of trails. I mean, you could do a whole, you could do a whole podcast show on just trails in the Cumberland Gap area and probably never run out of content. Right? Well, I don't know about never, but I mean, it would take, for unfit hikers, yeah. Because it would take us. There were hundreds of trails in there. Yeah. Hundreds of trails. You'd be doing a podcast every week for years at least. Okay. Covering all the trails. Are you trying to pitch an idea to me? I'm just saying we moved there and. We're not. Start, start hiking. We're further away from our moms though. So. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. So maybe somewhere down the road. Down the road. But I, I love this trail. We originally did not start out with the goal to do Tri-State Peak. We were just going to do Object Lesson Road and then head home because it was on our drive back to yeah. South Carolina. So, but we got up there and we're like, hey, you know you what? it's still early morning. It's right there. Let's do it. Yeah. And so we did. And I'm so glad we did. Yeah. So glad we did. We wouldn't have been able to meet those other three deer had we not. Mm-hmm. So would you recommend this? Uh-huh. A hundred percent. Yeah. Especially in fall. Especially in fall. <laughs> How would you classify this? Object lesson would be piece of piece cake. Of cake. Yeah. And then the tri state trail would be it's harder because it's that's where the elevation is, but it's not well I It's mean, barely a break of sweat, I think. Yeah. I mean it was so cold that morning, so there's no way you're gonna break a sweat really. Yeah. I don't know. What would you say? Break a sweat just because of the incline. Yeah. That's it. But over the course of a mile, it's not that bad. It, it, I never once that I feel like, oh, I need a break. Not a single time. It, yeah. It was good. So, yeah, I'd absolutely recommend this. This uh, Object Lesson Road and Tri State Peak Trail there in Cumberland Gap National Historical Park. You know what's interesting what's is up? that day one of our Kentucky trip with our, our first hike that we did, we saw deer. And the last day, we saw deer. So there were like deer bookends. Now I want deer bookends. You want some deer bookends? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm not, you're not going to get any pushback from me. <laughs> yeah. So definitely check these out if you're anywhere in the Cumberland Gap area. We, we highly recommend them. Mm-hmm. So what's today's fun fact about, Donna? I am so glad you asked. Today's fun fact is about the Pack Horse Librarians of Eastern Kentucky. The information I found today for the fun fact is from a book called... Before you start, okay. are we talking about horses that are librarians? No, no. Well, I mean. You got my hopes up there for a minute. So the librarians were riding the horses. The horses, they were pack horses because uh-huh. you would pack books into okay, bags. But the, li- on the-, the horses themselves were not handing them out and checking the them out. The horses might have been honorary librarians, if that okay. makes the story better for you. It does. It okay. does. You can continue. Okay. So the book was called Down Cut Shin Creek, The Pack Horse Librarians of Kentucky by Kathy Appelt and Jenna Schmeitzer. 
that's where most of the story most of the information from. Mm-hmm. Okay. This is a book that delves into the history of the Pack Horse Library Project, an initiative that was started during the Great Depression. This project was part of Franklin D. Roosevelt's work, Works Progress Administration, the WPA. The First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt was a strong advocate for the project, driven by her concern for the economic hardships faced by women and families. Okay. So the initiative provided employment opportunities for many women including single mothers who were struggling to support their families during this challenging period. I don't know if you know this, but I mean, we, we care about men too, of course, but during the great depression, there were a lot of men who left their wife and children because, because they couldn't provide. And it was probably too sad for them to stay around and see their families starving. So they just, they just, I don't want to see them starving, so I'm just going to not watch it. Yeah, from a long and way left. Away. Yeah. yeah, they went I'm out I'm hoping for... that's not the case. I'm hoping, I mean, I'm sure it was, right? I, you know. But I'm hoping that wasn't the case a lot, because that would speak poorly to people. I mean, uh, they probably just went out for cigarettes and beer and just forgot to come home. Oh. Or something. Okay. I don't know. But, I mean, Sad. some some stuck well, around. Some stuck around, but but... But anyway, this provided a job opportunity for a single mom okay. or for a woman who just wanted to help her husband. Who needed because, to make yeah. extra money, sure, during the Depression when nobody had any money. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it is inspiring to see how this project helped improve literacy in remote areas and provided much-needed jobs and hope to many families at the time. Because of the Great Depression and a lack of budget money, the American Library Association estimated in May 1936 that around a third of all Americans no longer had reasonable access to public library materials. Wow. A third of all Americans. We can't imagine that now. No. Because, you know, we have the entire knowledge of the human race. Yeah, at our fingertips. In our hands. Yeah. At any given moment. Books were so valuable yeah. back then. I, hey, you and I are old enough to remember having to go to the library. For reference oh, materials yeah. and having a stack of encyclopedias. Well, we were, at home. we were, yeah, we were, we had encyclopedias at home because there was a time when I was a kid when my parents, I think, sold encyclopedias. Oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah, I think it was. You have to ask your mom about that. Yeah, was, we had a we had a set of encyclopedias too, and they were old. Oh. They, were, they were like twenty years old by the time we got them because you know they they didn't print encyclopedias as often as news right, right, happened. Right. So. So yeah, so they were talking about things like this is not a country anymore. I, don't, <laughs> so. uh, I wonder what you know. I mean, because wasn't at some point Pluto wasn't a planet, and Pluto was a planet, and then it got declassified. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to me, it'll always be a planet. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Anyway, eastern rural Kentucky is a geographically isolated area cut off from much of the country. You and I know that to be true. We do know that to be true. Before the Pack Horse Library Project was created, many people in rural Appalachian Kentucky had no access to books. The percentage of people who were illiterate in eastern Kentucky was about 31%. So these are people that cannot read. And this is in the 20s and 30s, but, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. we're not talking the 1700s. Right. No, women this were is... discouraged from it. We're talking 1930s and 40s. There are people still alive who were alive back then. Right. Yeah. Or, you know, have heard stories from their grandparents or whatever. Yeah. Uh, my my mom and dad were born in 19... 19- so <laughs> they, they remember that Well, is that your, your mic cut off a 19- little bit? <laughs> okay. All right. People who lived in rural, mostly inaccessible areas wanted to become more literate because they saw education as a way to escape poverty. That was smart of them. So that, that just shows you that you can be smart and illiterate, right? Yeah. Intelligence has nothing to do with education. Right. So I found this interesting. In my research, I found out that traveling libraries were created by the Kentucky Federation of Women's Clubs starting in 1896. But the lack of roads and community centers in eastern Kentucky discouraged the creation of most public library services in those locations. So they had traveling li- they had libraries that would be pulled along on carts. By horses. Right, in wagons, sure. But there were, I'm talking about places that even those carts could not get through. This, right. So we're talking about trails that you would need. Yeah, just you and I single... saw the roads that were going to the small villages and towns that were there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, these aren't exactly passable. Right. Unfortunately, the traveling libraries were discontinued in 1933. 
So in Kentucky, 63 counties had no library services at all during the 1930s. Counties. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Oh, listeners, little inside information. Our cat Salem is helping us do this podcast today. He was on the table. Yep. And he will be back. So if you hear a meow or a yeah, that's something just... get knocked over, mm-hmm. it's just Salem saying hi to the audience. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so as I said, the Pack Horse Library Project was a Works Progress Administration WPA program that delivered books to remote regions in the Appalachian Mountains between 1935 and 1943. Women were very involved in the project, which eventually had 30 different libraries serving 100,000 people. So this was pretty big. That is big. For that area. Yeah. Yeah. Pack horse librarians were known by many different names, including book women, book ladies, and pack saddle librarians. The All better names than I would have expected back in the 1930s. Listen, in the 1930s, these were women wearing pants on the back of horses, bringing books to very rural Kentucky areas. That's blasphemy. I mean, yeah, they probably didn't get any pushback, probably. I, actually, we're going to get to that. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, the goal was to deliver books to remote and isolated communities. In the Appalachian region, particularly in eastern Kentucky, these librarians traveled on horseback through rugged terrain to bring books, magazines and other reading materials to people living in the mountains. The project helped improve literacy rates and brought hope and a sense of connection to the the wider world for many families. Of course it did. Mm -hmm. I mean, you and I were hiking these trails. They are very remote. They're cut off. Very remote. Yeah. You know, and radio wasn't as big as it was as it is now. Or as it was at its height in the, you know, 70s and 80s. Yeah. So their only source of news was and I word of mouth from travelers or... Sure. I don't know how many of these cabins that were that remote. I don't think they had power. I can't imagine of, many. You know, we're talking outhouses. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, yeah. Not even solar panels. I mean, it was pretty... No solar panels yeah. back in the 1930s? <laughs> <laughs> That's too rustic. Right. Too rustic. Yeah. But like you said, bringing hope. Can you imagine little kids? Yeah. You know... They, We're gonna, there's there's nothing there's no food there's poverty is literally everywhere around yeah. the country yeah and some nothing, nice lady comes up with a book or it's a the comic great book depression it's not yeah it called, wasn't called the big fun happy time t- right yeah. <laughs> so i'll bet you're wondering if the pack horse librarians faced any opposition or resistance donna did the pack horse librarians face any opposition or resistance I'm so glad you asked. I'm, thank you. Keep that up nicely. The Pack Horse librarians did face some opposition and resistance during their work. What? Yeah. Starting with suspicion and skepticism. Many mountain families were initially. I what? can't wait to hear this. <laughs> there ain't no books. Yeah. Well, no, it's a woman reading books. It's, it's a woman who's ridden on a horseback to my house in very remote eastern, Kentu- and, you know, like to bring what to, to bring me a book. What? What do you want? Yeah, you got to want something. You're trying to tell my wife to read. Well, and that probably did Probably was happen. a lot of it. You know, yeah. like women are like, holy crap, I could do that instead of this. Instead of staying at home, <laughs> popping out two dozen kids. Well, yeah. or, you know, just being depressed in the Great Depression, yeah. you know. Be- no, happy, fun, cool time. So many mountain families were initially suspicious of the librarians, viewing them as outsiders bringing in unfamiliar materials. The, this skepticism was partly because of the isolated nature of the communities and a general mistrust of outsiders. So, yeah. Okay. Outsiders were, were not trusted. You're bad. Yeah. Some individuals refused to accept the books because they saw them as charity and were skeptical that the service was free. I can actually, that makes sense that, to me. That makes sense to me yeah, too because I've, to me. I've been there before. First of all, you're coming to my house and I don't see people besides my family very often at all. So, skepticism. Right there. Sure. And during this time, you know, the happy, fun, cool time. Mm, Great Depression. Okay. Whatever. It's potato banana. Okay. But they would, I mean, everybody was trying to get over on another person to improve their station. A lot of people were. Right? So somebody showing up with something, no, you don't owe anything. We don't want anything. It's like, what? I'm not buying that. So, yeah. And while we're on this note, I just want to say, in my research, they did surveys to find out how many people were illiterate at this time. How do you know? Like, they can't fill out a survey. If you're illiterate, you can't read. So what? how does that work? Maybe. 
I don't. Maybe like during census, I, people, because they used to conduct censuses in person back then. Okay. So. Yeah. Okay. So, so make your mark and it's an X, you know, they can't. Or the census taker would just ask how many people in your house can read. Yeah. You know. I mean, okay. All right. Maybe. It's hard to say. It's hard to say. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure the, illiter- the illiteracy rate was higher than they reported. You think so? Yeah. 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 And then there was the terrain. This was also a something that they that qualifies for, you know, resistance. Of course. The librarians had to navigate challenging and often dangerous terrain, including impassable roads and trails. In some cases, they had to hike long distances with when their horses or mules were unable to continue. So they were So their horse couldn't couldn't continue because the trail was that rough. And, and these, these ladies women, are like Eh, let me, it's fine. I'm gonna strap this yeah, let me grab sack of books. books on, on exactly. my back. And, that's amazing. That yeah. is amazing. We go hiking and my water bottle's heavy. Yeah, I got and in I- a backpack with that <laughs> with that portable stool and I'm like, no, this is too much. Can you I imagine can't. bringing bo- hiking to bring books to somebody to to read? I guess the only benefit is if you're successful, your pack is lighter at the end of the trip. I mean, no, the, the benefit is that you're bringing a book to somebody who's not expo- or and 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 the literacy the how the re- the way that they increase the literacy is they sat there and they read these books to these people did they read yes. them to them they, it wasn't just a loner program I mean, it was probably both right it, it's it, both it was probably yeah, both. yeah 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 the pack horse librarians had many memorable encounters with the community members they served one woman was delivering on a regular basis she she was delivering to a man with a gunshot wound she recounted delivering books to a man who had been permanently injured from a gunshot wound. Despite his injury, he eagerly, eagerly awaited the librarian's visit oh. and the books she brought. I have a picture. I can put that. Oh, yeah. He's like, Make sure you put this picture on Instagram. He's actually in a bedridden. He is bedridden. With- and, oh, this is, this is such a great photo because this, this totally encapsulates this time period. The walls are wallpapered with newspaper. Mm-hmm old newspaper and that they that was so common back then to keep the soot off the walls from exactly. the fireplace what yeah. they would do is they would just layer another layer of walls newspaper the, yeah. on their walls because Which they sure, had the wood fireplace yeah and the, the this was non-flammable newspaper right cuz like if the fire got out of the hearth then that, that's perfectly safe right well what they would do to get it up there is they'd wet it down oh okay they'd wet the the newspaper up and oh, i mean kind of like paper mache that's exactly they what paper it was. Yeah, they paper mached their walls. They paper mached their walls. And this guy is, he totally is into what she's reading. It looks like a magazine. It's hard to tell. It looks like a magazine. Yeah. And that lady looks nice. She's got a nice coat on. Yeah. Yep. So. Yeah. So we'll put this picture on Instagram so you can see it. It's amazing. Yeah. Yep. That guy's not going anywhere. For, so for her to come and read that yeah, magazine or book to she him. She brought the outside world to him. Oh, he, he must have loved her visits. Yeah. So, but they, they also, as we've touched on, they had to cross treacherous terrain to reach remote homes. One story tells of a librarian who had to cross a log bridge to deliver books to a mountain community. These journeys were physically demanding and dangerous, yet the librarians persevered to ensure that everyone had access to reading materials. Yeah, and we're not even talking about bears and coyotes yeah. and mountain lions. We're, not, sure. we're just discounting that as the, the mm-hmm. least destructive thing yeah, on there for them. Yeah, they didn't I mean, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Due to a shortage of books, librarians because let me tell you, this program, the the FDR program for this, they just covered the paychecks for these librarians. They did not cover supplies like books, the books that these librarians were bringing. Really? Yeah. So where the books come from? The bur- the books were coming from they were the throwaway books that other bigger libraries were like we this is garbage. This is old. This is garbage. We don't oh, want to okay. circulate it anymore. So we're going to give it to this. I mean, better than like burning them or throwing them yeah. away. At, at but least they're being reused. Also, librarians and community members created scrapbooks filled with magazine clippings, recipes, and local stories. These scrapbooks became highly popular and were eagerly anticipated by the families they visited. Oh, can you imagine? Yeah. A, a, a scrapbook with recipes. That was and, made with love. Uh, absolutely. Some some people love scrapbooking. This was a time in history when scrapbooks really made a difference. I thought this might have been the beginning of scrapbooking, so I looked it up. But it wasn't. The, it was not the beginning of scrapbooking. Okay. 
What a great use for it, though. Yeah. Scrapbooking started in the 15th century when people started preserving important scraps like love letters, poems, and other paper memorabilia and books. But I feel like scrapbooking was incredibly important during this time. They had approximately 800 books that had to be shared among five to 10,000 patrons. Wow. So that's crazy. Yeah. 800 books for 10,000 people. Yeah. Yeah. So, that is nuts. So, yeah, they innovative people, right? I mean, making scrapbooks. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Initially, some families were suspicious of the librarians and their books. However, the librarians built trust over time by reading because a lot of the people were resistant because they felt like the only book that should be read is the Bible. And so they were resistant to other books. So what these librarians did to sort of break the ice was they would read Bible passages and engage with the community that way. They would so this trust allowed them to introduce a wider variety of reading materials. So that is very smart. Yeah. I would not have that. You, we, level you wouldn't of have gone there. Empathy. I feel for like those people. I feel like the Bible was a gateway book. If you were, I mean, that's what it sounds like, right? It sounds like they were using it to, oh, and if you like the story of Jonah and the whale, how about this Uh, nonfiction story about agriculture? Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. who knows? But yeah, the, the Pack Horse librarians had many humorous and heartwarming moments during their journeys, too. Here are, uh, well, you, you mentioned kids. Children would eager, eagerly wait for the librarian's arrival. They would often run down the path to meet her excitedly shouting, the book lady is here. Their enthusiasm and joy at receiving new books were incredibly rewarding for the librarians. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. If I, you know, so these kids are working the land. Yeah. Probably not going to school very well, often. If, if at, at all. all. I if mean, all. and honestly, that was one of the issues, too, is that there are not libraries out there for these remote places. There's also not schools. Right, right. And so the boredom level is probably off the charts well, for either, these poor children. I mean, they're, they're, and there's prob- not much they're food hungry. to go around. Yeah. You, like you said, they're probably working the land or, yeah. you know, And so these women showing whatever. up to bring them some joy of something new. Something new. And she's going to read to them. Yeah. And she's going to teach their mom and dad how to read. And then their mom and dad can read. Yeah. Them, you know, it's incredible. If I was one of those people and some sweet little girl came up and said, the book man is here. I, I would, just, I would just probably set up a camp outside. Yeah. Their house and just like, go I, and read every okay, day. I live here now. Yeah. But except that you have to go back to I gotta get, go get more, more, books. more books. And you have to like, you know, tur- once you finish that book, you have to turn it in, and, you know. So that somebody else can read it. Yeah, yeah. But in one humorous instance, a librarian had to deal with a stubborn mule that refused to cross a stream. After several attempts, she decided to read aloud to the mule from one of the books she was carrying. Whether it was the soothing voice or the content, the mule eventually crossed the stream, much to the amusement of the librarian. That's hilarious. Yeah. So this mule's <laughs> like, no, lady, I am not going I'm across not, this And she's stream. like, okay, well, we'll just sit here we'll and read. Just sit here and read. And <laughs> I wonder if the mules was like, this story is horrible. How do we make it end? Let You're me like, just cross this dang screen stream. So you can go in, over with. go in a house and read that to some read other. Read that terrible story to somebody. Or this is such an awesome inspired. Now I'm going to cross the stream. Because yeah. I'm not a mule anymore. I'm a, I'm a Flying racehorse. Po- yeah, whatever. Yeah. yeah. A particularly touching story involves a librarian who regularly visited an elderly man living alone in the mountains. Initially, he was very reserved and skeptical of her visits, but over time, he began to look forward to her visits, not just for the books, but for the companionship. Straight company. Yeah. Yeah. They developed a deep friendship, and he even started sharing his own stories, which she would write down and include it in the community scrapbooks. Oh, that's so fantastic. Yeah. So that that lives on, that man's story, because of what that woman did. Yeah. Would have died with him. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So- Anyway, that's my fun fact. That is that is such a great fun fact. That is such a great fun fact. And yeah. this was one of the ones that I had not heard before. You, you briefly mentioned, you know, these yeah. the pack librarians. And so I, I intentionally didn't do any research on them. There's, a, there's more information. It's, well, there's, there's a whole a book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> at, at least one. Not, on not even. Yeah, it's, there's plenty. And then there's also, if you want to look up, there's YouTube videos of what are they called interviews with with 
a man whose grandmother was a oh, really? librarian and he would talk about, you know, some of his grandmother's stories. Yes. That's great. What was this book again called? This book was called Hang on. Down Cut Shin Creek. Down Cut Shin Creek. The Pack Horse Librarians of Kentucky. By by Kathy Appelt and G- Jenna Schmitzer. 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 So if you're on Amazon looking for something good to read, you know, yeah. check it out. It's a well-researched book. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. It, and check out the YouTube videos. Just look up for Pack look look up Pack Librarians, Kentucky. Pack Horse Librarians YouTube, and, of Eastern Kentucky. And you'll Kentucky. find you'll find yeah. some videos on it. Thank you, Donna. That was a good fun fact. You're welcome. Now let's talk about an amazing place that we stumbled a- across to get some really good Dutch food. Mm-hmm. So today's review is about the Dutch Treat, which is a Dutch bakery, sandwich shop, delicatessen, ice cream counter, yeah. store, ready-made jellies. I mean, it basically has everything that you could possibly need. Cookies, eat. cakes. Ugh, just all, all stuff that's either made there or sourced from Dutch communities nearby. Yeah. Yeah. So it's located at 133 De Royal Industries Road, Rose Hill, Virginia, 24281. And the website is thedutchtreat.biz. That's T-H-E-D-U-T-C-H-T-R-E-A-T dot B-I-Z. And what's particularly neat about this place is just on the side of the road. It's kind of unassuming looking when you pull up to it. And then you walk in and uh, it's amazing. The smells are amazing. They have got the, everything that you could need or want yeah. right there in that in that store. the The first thing that that you see when you go in is their candies area. Yeah, like when you walk in, you see all these candies, cookies, and cakes. We're and... Talking, we bought a big bag of ginger snaps because you and I like ginger snaps, and yeah. that bag lasted two days, maybe <laughs> maybe two days. They also had some great jerky, which I got some. Yeah, I got some local jerky there and it was amazing it was i want to talk about the sandwiches though i the sandwiches to me were to die for the bread was fresh and thick slices of bread and the meat was delicious it was like a dagwood sandwich oh my goodness it was so good so it the ordering is something that i hadn't seen before but you and i have since seen yes since we went there at a different dutch place here in uh, upstate south carolina so you there's paper on the counter mm-hmm. and you basically write down everything you want. Yeah, what there's kind like of bread you want, what kind mm-hmm. of meats, cheeses, toppings, your mayo. name yeah. at, on the paper and then yeah, you basically write down your order on this piece of paper, put it in a box and they just they pull it and, and a lady in a traditional Dutch outfit will Yep. <laughs> will make it. It was great. It was so delicious. I had what did I have that day? It was a turkey. I think it was a I think it was a ham and turkey. Mm-hmm. Is what I had that day. With horseradish mayonnaise, and it was so good. Yeah, I don't. I so just, good. I here's what I know: the Dutch treat. Okay, so it's in Virginia, and we live in Greenville, South Carolina, and it is what three and a half hours from yep. our home to get there. And we have considered we almost making, went this past weekend making a day trip yeah. just to go and just finding a hike along the, between yeah. the Dutch treat and Which our there's home. There's tons. Yeah, there's for tons sure, because you're driving out. literally through North Carolina to get to yep. the Dutch treat, but it's that good and. I yeah, it's sandwiches that you dream about at night. We will definitely be going back. Hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the sandwiches were so big that we only ate half of each for sure. of ours. Yeah. And had the second half for dinner that day. Yeah. Yeah. It was incredible, and the people there could not have been more nice. Yeah. Everybody, the 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 young lady behind the deli counter making our sandwiches was sweet as could be. There's a gazebo out to the side of the parking lot and there's a there was a cat that there's was cat. <laughs> that was kind of hanging out like hey you got something for me and yeah <laughs> I mean, it was a sweet cat it was a sweet sweet cat clearly an outside cat yeah and that cat knows where to hang out uh-huh now you're not supposed to feed it i'm guessing I, i'm sure they don't really discourage it but somebody on this podcast who shall remain nameless okay drop some food but, yeah i don't remember that you don't remember that no you don't remember dropping food for the cat no I don't, I, and I think that's something that I would remember. Mm. Mm. You know, your mom's listening right now, right? <laughs> your mom's listening and she's going to get you for lying. My mom would be like, take care of that cat. That cat looks <laughs> That cat great. was fat. He had been taken <laughs> care of. There was, 
That cat was not hurting for food. <laughs> the Dutch treat. Yeah. The Dutch treat. Would you recommend it? 100%. Oh, 100. I recommend it so much. We almost drove three and a half hours just to get a sandwich. We probably will at some point. Probably next weekend. Yeah. Maybe. yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the Dutch treat at 133 De Royal Industries Road in Rose Hill, Virginia. Be sure to check it out if you're anywhere in the area. If you're within an hour, it's well worth your drive mm-hmm. just to get there. And the, the, the specialty foods that you can find in that place and like nowhere else, like mm-hmm. authentic, made locally in an Amish community or d- Dutch community, Mennonite, whatever, jams and jellies and grains that yeah. were, yeah, stone Special ground. milled yeah. grits. Yeah, it was amazing. So they have everything you need. The Dutch Treat in Rose Hill, Virginia, Donna and I highly recommend it. Highly. So that's our episode this week, guys. The Object Lesson Road and Tri-State Peak Trail in Cumberland Gap National Historical Park in Kentucky. Just a a fantastic trail to get you to an amazing view of three states. We saw deer Mm -hmm. in two separate spots. It was a a really enjoyable end cap to our trip to Kentucky. Our first of many, I have no doubt. And then you also told us about the pack horse librarians of Kentucky at the turn at in the 1920s and 30s. Yes. What an incredible story of some, some, we didn't really talk much about it, but those women had to have been incredibly brave. Oh, yeah. To go out by themselves yeah. in these very rural, very treacherous areas. If you see some of the pictures that the these horses that they're on and they're packed with books and yeah. a woman on top, and then the the, the trail is like, Almost sideways. Narrow. Yeah, narrow and sideways. Seen, you and I yeah. have been on these narrow trails. To yeah. walk them ourselves with a hiking pole is yeah. one thing, but to be on the back of a horse and trust it, I mean, horses are very sure-footed. They but are, still. But, but they're also much wider. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, an incredible story that I was so happy that you brought to us. And then the Dutch treat here in yep. uh, Rose Hill, Virginia was such a wonderful end to our trip. It, that was the last place we stopped before we mm-hmm. headed home. Yeah. So we we recommend that the uh, Dutch treat in Rose Hill, Virginia. Mhm. And so that was a good good trip, good Kentucky trip for us. It really Kentucky was. Kentucky and Virginia and we're going to have to do it again. I don't know, what do you say next week? <laughs> well, maybe not next week. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening. Please like us and subscribe to us in whatever podcast app you use and be sure to leave us a review because that's how our show grows. Feel free to check out our trail photos at casualclimbers.com or on Instagram at casualclimberspodcast. If you have a question, comment, or just want to drop us a line, you can reach us at casualclimberspodcast at gmail.com. So Donna, I wonder how many of those pack horse librarians found their soulmates while they were delivering books. Oh, I don't know about that. You don't think? Mm -hmm. Delivering books, there happens to be an older son or, you know, a widower. Something like that. I don't know. Maybe. That'd I didn't neat. find any. It'd be of a neat stories. story to tell your kids. How'd your mom meet? Oh, she blazed a trail with a uh. horse laden with books and came and read to us. That'd be a sweet story. Yeah. That'd be a sweet story. You know, you know how I, how I think they really got around? How? They were guided by Sasquatch. Yeah, I yeah. They were I guided was, by Sasquatch. I was so I was just I'm sure if you it. read the whole book, it would be in there. Prop I I read a lot of it, so I'm pretty sure Sasquatch is not in it. I think you just missed it. Okay. It was in the later chapter. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we'll see you out on the trail, everybody. <laughs> see you on the trail.